the headlines, Parliament's approved 2016 budget and economic policy. International Day Against Corruption, Mark. And an international news Rwanda to hold referendum on President Paul Kagame's third term in office. Hello, good evening, and thanks so much for joining us. This is News Hour, live on your news channel, GBC24 and GTV. My name is Akbene Avo Ajaja. Many thanks for joining us, and my name is Selike Makola Chiapalo, also here with us in the studio to give us a sign language translation of the news package is Robert Frimpong Manso. Now the news in detail. Parliament has approved the 2016 budget and economic policy. Rounding up the debate for its approval, the Minister for Finance, Seth Tekbe, reiterated the intention of the government to sustain economic growth. He said, so far, the rate of increase in the country's external debt has moved into the negative. Mr. Tekbe said the government's initiatives on the economic front has proven to be working. The financial policy for next year was presented to Parliament on the 13th of last month by the Finance Minister. The budget, among other things, intends to expand initiatives like the LEAP program to cover 250,000 households for the current 190,000. The government again plans to spend 2.5 million Ghana cities on other initiatives geared at ending poverty. And moving on in other news, President John Dramani Mahama has rejected the recent Africa corruption report issued by Transparency International. Speaking at the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan Conference in Accra to mark International Day Against Corruption, President Mahama noted that the report sampled respondents whose submissions are described by the corruption agency itself as subjective. Again, Mr. Mahama said the corruption perception about Ghana is probably because his administration does not sweep their occurrence under the carpet but thrusts them into open investigation and prosecution and penalties. Napoleon Atikito reports. The one-year-old National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, NACAP, gives a roadmap for the next 10 years. The Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, SHRAJ, is a monitoring agency of NACAP. SHRAJ says it can only perform to the extent that it is funded by government. Parliament passed the NACAP bill laid before it by government last year, and that allowed the president to constitute an implementation committee with the duty of enforcing action on corruption. President John Mahama issued a strongly worded text to that effect to mark International Day on Anti-Corruption, saying the heads of public establishments who do not comply with NACAP recommendations will be severely sanctioned. The implementation of NACAP will be a criteria for assessing the performance of ministers, heads and chief executives of public sector institutions. I expect heads and CEOs of state institutions to comply with directives that are issued to them. If any head does not do so, then he or she is in the wrong place. He cited measures government is taking against culprits in alleged corruption cases, like the scandal at the National Service Scheme, the judiciary, and JIDA, among others. I share the sentiments and sometimes the impatience of the public concerning the pace at which some of the investigations are proceeding. But our commitment to constitutional governance and the rights of persons and join us to be patient with the judicial process. I can assure you that my government will investigate, expose, and deal with all allegations of corruption that are brought to my attention. The president recommended innovative ways of dealing with corruption. Our greatest success in the fight against corruption must be based on preventing it. We must speed up the use of technology to remove much of the human discretion in our public service transactions. We must also move from a cash-based society into a cashless one. I intend to outline some new measures to this effect in the State of the Nation address scheduled for February next year. 
The president again highlighted the malfeasance uncovered under judgment deaths and said the state will enforce the white paper issued on it. The commissioner's report reveals the weaknesses in our systems and also shows how some persons in collusion with public officers deliberately fleeced government of hundreds of millions of CDs and in some cases US dollars. Even before the presentation of the report, the Attorney General upon my directive commenced robust defense of all cases of judgment debt. This action has paid off, paid off with massive savings recorded. In international cases this year alone, as much as $900 million in claims against the state were successfully defended. In domestic cases uh, this year alone, for 2015, claims of over $100 million were successfully resisted by the Attorney General's department. That Ghana was second most corrupt country in Africa, according to a report by Transparency International. President Mahama said sampling subjective views cannot be objectively conclusive. In fact, it was to avoid this kind of misinterpretation of the results that the same methodology in the reports itself stressed the fact that the results for each country, and I quote, are based on the subjective perceptions and experiences of citizens rather than an assessment against a common objective benchmark. Quotations closed. And so this quotation was put there to avoid exactly the misinterpretation that people have given to it. There was no ranking in that report, and it's absolutely false that Ghana is the second most corrupt country in Africa. We reject it completely. Exposure of corruption cases, which might have been shelved in the past, cannot make the enforcer any corrupt, he queried. In the past, even though we have all been aware of the existence of corruption in many facets of our public services, some past governments have been unwilling to take the risk of exposing and prosecuting corruption. Prosecutions that have occurred have mostly been of political opponents after having lost power. There is a real risk of a heightened perception of corruption by the public that may seek to imply that corruption has increased rather than the fact that hidden corruption is being exposed and sanctioned. This is a risk my government will accept and a challenge we are willing to confront. Dominic Sam, representing the UN system in Ghana, described corruption as most corrosive agents which deny people legitimate benefits and which must be punished. The head of the European Union delegation in Ghana, William Hanna, commended the Ghana payroll cleansing project, indicating that it has saved Ghana over 100 million Ghana cities. He said the national corruption debate must not necessarily be given political twist if the unity behind Ghana to stamp out the canker is to make any meaning. Meanwhile, a Ghana Integrity Awards are to be instituted after modalities are set. Napoleon Atukitu reporting. A high-level meeting of the Fisheries Committee for the West Central Gulf of Guinea is underway in Accra to fashion out ways to combat illegal fishing. Illegal fishing leads to reduction in fish stock and a collapse in the fishing ecosystem. Experts say addressing illegal fishing will contribute immensely to the growth and empowerment of the people who rely on fishing as a means of livelihood. According to FAO Fisheries and Aquaculture Department, illegal fishing accounts for an estimated $23 billion in losses per year globally. However, the situation of the coast of West Africa is particularly critical as illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing accounts for an estimated 40% of fish caught, the highest level worldwide. The Fisheries Committee for the West Central Gulf of Guinea, FCWC, was established in 2007 to facilitate cooperation in fisheries management between the member countries, namely Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Nigeria. Among other things, the FCWC seeks to promote cooperation among its member states with a view to ensuring, through appropriate management, the conservation and optimum utilization 
of the living marine resources and encouraging sustainable development of fisheries. The 8th FCWC Conference of Ministers of Fisheries therefore allowed the ministers and other stakeholders to review the activities, documents and initiatives of FCWC and develop an action plan the year ahead. A Chief Director of the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture, Madam Rebecca Amo Abwaji, said there is the need for member countries to collaborate and pool resources together to fight against the menace. Combating illegal fishing will require improved monitoring, control and surveillance, enactment and enforcement of fisheries laws and regulations, and most importantly, fisheries education of stakeholders. If our fisheries resources are not sustainably managed, stocks may collapse and fishing may cease to be economically viable. The conference was under the theme, Combating Illegal Fishing for Sustainable Management of Our Fisheries Resources. It attracted ministers of fisheries from the member countries and experts from around the world. The Director General of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, Major Albert Donchebe, has urged organizations to pay critical attention to their HR departments because it is that department that ensures the success or failure of an organization. Major Albert Donchebe made the statement at the third conference of the Human Resource Practitioners Network of the Public Service. The conference was held here in Accra. This is the third time human resource practitioners in public service have met to share ideas and good practices in human resource management. They addressed issues of specific priority to HR needs like development programs among its members and the need to modernize HR in the public sector to be in line with the global trends. Under the theme, Modernizing HR for effective and efficient public service delivery in the 21st century, participants were asked to reposition themselves and redefine their functions by creating a strong professional network of human resource managers to champion the importance of their profession. Addressing participants, the Director General of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, Major Retired Albert Donchebe, was emphatic that the success of any organization depends on the human resource and the regular training they undergo. This is the function that grows organizations, that develops organizations, that ensures the difference between success and failure of an organization. Because if we all agree that it is human beings who make organizations, then obviously the person who manages human beings, who recruits, trains, develops, and retains them must be a crucial or critical factor in the success of these organizations. The chairman of the conference, Mr. John Wilson, asked all HR practitioners to seek further professional training to ensure quality service in the public sector. HR managers in the public service occupy a strategic position in the development of a country. Having this in mind, the HR management in the public sector must also continuously change to remain relevant and contribute more towards the national development. To help boost the profession, a human resource network was established and inaugurated on the 4th of November 2014. It is a platform to share ideas and propose solutions to the challenges facing HR practitioners in the public sector. The wife of the Vice President, Mrs. Matilda Misa Arthur, is encouraging caregivers of children to look out for and help develop their God-given talents while helping with their educational and other needs. Mrs. Misa Arthur was speaking at a children's home, Brothers and Sisters in Christ Serving Basics International at Choco in Accra. A report by Theodora Medito. These are members of the Brothers and Sisters in Christ Serving, Basics International, displaying their talent. It is in gratitude to God, first of all, and to Mrs. Matilde Misa Arthur for her second visit this year. 
as is customary, Mrs. Emisa Arthur for the past 15 years visits the house to support the upkeep of the children. This time, she gave out food supplies including rice and oil as well as books for the children. I hope that in the new year, you all learn hard, be good students, and then as I promised you, we'll set a date for the flute concert. The founder of the house, Madame Patricia Wilkins, and her husband and the children were happy for the gift. We appreciate everything that you have done for us this year, last year, the years past. We hope that your own household is blessed as much as we have been blessed. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Interacting with the staff, Mrs. Emisa Arthur commended them for their hard work and asked them to continue to seek the good of the children entrusted under their care. In the heart of Choco lies Basics International, a non-profit, non-governmental and Christian faith-based organization helping children who are victims of child labor, parental neglect or have dropped out of school. After a brush-up, they are reintegrated into the government or private school system. It has three facilities, a social intervention center, a creative hub, and a boarding house for at-risk girls to ensure that they remain in and complete school. Theodora Medeto, GBC 24, Choco. Now let's do some politics. There are indications that the National Delegates Congress of the People's National Convention, PNC, slated for December 11, 2015, may face some delays. This is because one of the candidates contesting for the chairmanship slot of the party, David Apesera, wants another aspirant, Bernard Mona, disqualified from the race. The case is still in court, and this begs the question of how this latest development will affect Saturday's planned Congress. We now have on the line the national chairman of the PNC, Alhaji Ahmed Ramadan, who will be speaking to the issue. Good evening, Alhaji Ramadan. Good evening, sir. And yeah, if you can evening. hear me. Right. Thank you very much for joining us. It's just right. about two days to your National Delegates Congress and with this case still in court. How is this going to affect operations towards the Congress uh, coming up on Saturday? Uh, thank you so very much. Um, we have done everything to, you know, kickstart the Congress. Mm. Uh, we have paid for everything that we need to do. Uh, the only thing is the this, this uh, motion that is creating a little hold up. Uh, for now, we have gone to uh, Court as a party to put up appearance as demanded by the motion, which uh, they want to, you know, uh, move on the 18th. Um, we have put up appearance, and then we are also moving the motion to abridge the time so that uh, we are listened to on Friday, that is uh, the day after tomorrow, on right. Friday. If we are granted that opportunity to move a motion, you know, for that. Probably we will be able to convince the judges that, uh, you know, it's better to allow the, the process to continue smoothly. Um, we can't say much until we are listened to on Friday. So right. at the start now, we are waiting to be there, to, to be in court on Friday and move our motion. If we succeed, uh, certainly we will move from court straight to uh, WA to begin our processes of uh, having our Congress on Saturday and Sunday if need be. But uh, if it doesn't work out that way, then we'll see the uh, other windows will be available to us uh, to move pass through. Right, but given the timelines between Friday and Saturday, regardless of whatever the, the decision that will be taken on Friday, will you be able to put yourselves together then for Saturday's Congress? Yeah, so far we have not issued any instruction to the people, to the contrary, that we are not going to have the Congress acted on the 12, 13, and, uh, 12 and 13. So, uh, and then the uh, Friday will be the, 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 the 12. So we, we believe that uh, if it works out well in court on Friday, 
We'll go on air and let people understand that the exercise will continue as planned, and we'll all move to far and uh, possibly have our next meeting, you know, in the night of uh, today, and proceed to do the Congress on Saturday. Otherwise, we shift it today so that we have the Congress on Sunday. Right. Are you considering the possibility of a postponement, depending on how things go? And when will that be? We don't hope for it. But if it becomes uh, the only option available to us, we will postpone it. But uh, for now, we we see that uh, good reason will prevail amongst us. And uh, maybe if we are fortunate to get uh, a good hearing from the uh, court, you know, we will go ahead and pray. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Alhaji Ahmed Ramadan. Uh, he is right. the national chairman of the PNC, and he has been speaking to the issue of issues pertaining to the party's upcoming National Delegates Congress slated for uh, Saturday. This is News Hour on GBC 24. We'll take a quick break. When we return, the news will continue. Do stay with us. It's that time of your evening for some business news. My name is Esther Adu. The Chief Executive Officer of Cocoa Board, Dr. Michael Oponi, has denied allegations that the mass brain exercise and cocoa fertilizer distribution are no longer operational. Responding to claims that Ghana's cocoa production has declined due to a halt in these programs, Dr. Opuni said it has rather improved with about $200 million spent on mass cocoa spray this year. He spoke to GBC24 on the sidelines of the Maiden World Cocoa Farmers Organization Summit held in Accra. Cocoa production in the 2001-2002 crop season stood at 341,000 metric tons. Production hit a record 1 million metric tons in the 2010-2011 crop season. Since this milestone, there has been a downward trend over the years, with the current cocoa production figure pegged at 740,000 metric tons. Critics attribute the reduction to an alleged halt in the cocoa mass spraying exercise, reduced investment in the agricultural sector, and a halt in fertilizer distribution. At the maiden summit of the World Cocoa Farmers Organization, the chief executive of the Ghana Cocoa Board, Dr. Stephen Oponi, debunked these claims. Um, last year, about $200 million was budgeted for this free mass spraying and free fertilizer program this year, same. So it is never true that this program has been halted, it's rather uh, improved, and farmers are actually benefiting from it. The interim president of the World Cocoa Farmers Organization and the 2013-2014 Best Cocoa Farmer, Nana Abraham Edusei, confirmed that the mass spraying exercise is still ongoing. As years go by, the trees continue uh, being out of production. And therefore, if for five years production is going down, it means there's something wrong. Wrong is that the cocoa trees are over aged, and therefore we have to take them out of the system, put in new ones. And that is exactly what the government is doing. The World Cocoa Organization brings together cocoa farmers from cocoa growing countries with the aim of presenting a uniform voice on the international cocoa stage. The organization is worried about the neglect of cocoa farmers when it comes to taking decisions that shape the cocoa industry. A high-powered Italian business delegation is in the country at the instance of this government to begin talks on boosting trade and investment between Ghana and Italy. On Wednesday, Vice President Emisa Atha told the delegation at a meeting at the Flagstaff House that Ghana is ripe for huge volumes of investment and trade. The visit of this business delegation is a response to President John Mohammed's meeting with Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi recently, which focused on tapping vast investment opportunities in Ghana. The political decision saw the Italian Industrial Association showing interest in investing in various areas such as infrastructure, energy and industry where the Italians have great know-how. 
The Italian Vice Minister of Economic Development, Carlo Calenda, said his government intends to be based in Ghana to invest in the entire sub-region. We would like to bring here um, companies, banks, big companies, but also small and medium enterprises. But what we have to do now is to focus very well on which sector we, we have to uh, focus on, uh, so that then we can be extremely effective. Vice President Kwesi Misa Arthur mentioned the Pualugu Tomato Factory, Western Rail Lines and the energy sectors as preferred for huge investments. Our next step is now to go into the sectors, into the rail sectors, and to start projects, especially infrastructure projects, and projects that add value to production that takes place in our country. The Italians are the next show and register their interest in industry in Ghana after China and India. And now from Kumasi, the Royal Bank is to open five new branches in the Quran next year to increase its base to 27. The bank plans to establish another branch in Tamale later next year to bring its Royal Banking services closer to its customers. At an end-of-year reception organized for clients in Kumasi, the managing director of the bank, Robert Corbento, made the announcement. About 200 customers attended the program where ideas were exchanged between customers and management of the bank. The Royal Bank has been in the banking industry for eight years with a current staff strength of about 500. Mr. Bentel said, Royal Bank is an indigenous financial institution wholly owned and managed by Ghanaians and therefore appealed to the public to patronize the bank. He said, management quickly responds to customers' needs and makes the bank unique among its peers. We invited you here to show our appreciation for your immense support, which has allowed us to make this significant strides within the Ghanaian banking sector. Your support resulted in the bank winning international and local awards over the period. These include the New Era Award for Total Quality Customer Satisfaction received in Rome, Italy in June 2014 and Top Emerging Brand at the Top Brand Awards in December 2014. One of the clients, Nana Kweku Amankwasa Kodie, commended the bank for being innovative and prompt in attending to customers. He asked the bank to continue to provide the clients with technology-based services. Anytime I go to the bank, the way that they serve me, the way that they do everything to me, I am even happier than where I was. So I am calling all, all the customers, those who have people who are wealthy to banking, Please advise them to go to Royal Bank. Some of the customers complained about high interest rates, high inflation, and the devaluation of the local currency. They therefore are government as a matter of urgency to do something about it to save businesses from collapsing. In the Upper West region, the Nandom Rural Bank recorded a profit of 806,000. 860 Ghana cities for the 2014 financial year, representing an increase of 22%. The chairman of the board of directors, Mr. Eugene Yibo, announced the figure when interacting with shareholders of the bank. The Nandom Rural Bank recorded positive movements in all the crucial areas of operations that measures the strength and growth of banking institutions. Notable among the indicators are deposits, advances, short-term investments, share capital, net worth and total assets, all totaling 32,830,392 Ghana cities. The modest gain made by the bank was achieved through an impressive performance in the areas of interest income, commission and fee income. According to the chairman of the board of directors, Mr. Eugene Yebo, following the impressive showing of the bank, the directors have earmarked the disbursement of 173,774 Ghana cities as dividends to shareholders. The increase in the bank asset base indicates that the bank was able to grow the stock of resources which were required to generate more income and therefore increase shareholder value. 
the acting manager of the WAB branch of the ARB Apex Bank, Mr. Kwejo Odum Akwa, tags the Board of Rural Banks to initiate organizational and operational transformation, especially in the areas of ICT, risk management, compliance, and effective deposit mobilization, among others. Competition is normal and inevitable. One sure way to face increased competition is to improve our customer services, to attract new ones, and to maintain existing ones. A customer of the bank, Madam Comfort Kuliki, who has benefited from the operations of the bank, urged her fellow traders to take advantage of the bank to improve their businesses. And back in Accra, the consumer price inflation for the month of November has been pegged at 17.6%. This marks a 0.2 percentage increase from the October figure of 17.4%. The Deputy Government Statistician, Mr. Bawadie, said the year-on-year non-food inflation rate of 23.2% is three times higher than the food inflation rate of 7.9%. Price drivers for the high, relatively high inflation we are witnessing where there's substantial, substantial price changes in the prices of non-food commodities. And um, these um, changes, price level changes in the non-food were relatively higher than what we witnessed for food items. And there were specific items that actually showed much increase in the change in the price level. We have, for example, education, which recorded an inflation rate of 29.6%. We have recreation and culture, which also recorded a 26.6% um, uh, increase. We have transport, which recorded 26.2%. Clothing and footwear, which also recorded about 26.5%. Finishings and household equipment and routine maintenance which recorded a rate of about 25.4. Then we have housing, water, electricity, gas, and other fuels, which recorded a rate of 24.1%. These were higher than the average that we observed for the entire uh, non-food group. And these pulled up, these were the drivers for the high inflation that we are witnessing. Just by a click of a button. Sorry about that. Just by a click of a button, movers of goods and services across the 15 West African countries can now report challenges encountered at the borders for real-time response. This follows the launch of an electronic platform by the Borderless Alliance and the Ghana Shippers Authority in Accra. International trade remains the single largest driver of economies the world over. It accounts for 80% of the world economic activity involving the movement of goods and services across borders, countries or continents. However, Africa remains the least performer in global trade with a share of about 2.5% of international trade. This is largely on account of poorly harmonized custom regime, lack of value added exports and multiple trade barriers in the region. The e-platform will therefore help traders within ECOWAS to report challenges they encounter on the borders. The executive director of Borderless Alliance, Zaid Hamuyu, hopes the platform will help facilitate trade in West Africa. The benefit of having an electronic platform is that it is accessible from everywhere in the, in the region. So it doesn't have to start in Ghana if you want to file complaints from elsewhere. Basically, the system is online, is running. You can actually file the complaints, and there is some back-end work, but it is being piloted on the Ghana, on the Temawaga corridor. The president of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, George Ofori, complained about the multiple checkpoints along trade routes in the West African sub-region. We keep on talking about free movement of people, goods and services, but at the end of the day, have we achieved that desired objective or that aim? No. Yet still, so, there are some borders that have barriers, and if we are talking about trade facilitation, well, you can have barriers sometimes to check on security issues but not on trade facilitation. The e-platform will be piloted in Ghana and replicated in the rest of the Ekwa sub-region in the years ahead.
The business news was brought to you by Ecobank, Hisense and Airtel. Have a good evening. Back, this is the health segment. Since the outbreak of the avian influenza in the country, the Veterinary Services Department of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture has destroyed over 74,000 birds. The deadly disease which hits five regions in the country also led to the destruction of over 1,000 crates of eggs as well as over 600 bags of feed. The acting director of the Veterinary Services Directorate, Dr. Augusto Zaite, disclosed the figures at a forum in Kumasi for poultry farmers. The forum looked at challenges of the bird flu outbreak and measures to curb them. The avian flu was first reported in Greater Accra region and spread to the Volta, Central, Western and Ashanti regions. 31 poultry farmers were affected and their beds destroyed in view of the severity and dangers associated with the disease to avoid further spread to other farms. More than 3 million Ghana cities has been paid as compensation to 25 out of the 31 farmers. Dr. Aite said what is of serious concern is that the disease does not only affect poultry but human beings as well. That is why the Veterinary Services Directorate is actively engaging all relevant stakeholders to fight the disease. He said the Directorate has put in place plans to effectively tackle the situation. Measures include farmers fora, radio and television talk shows and distribution of posters and flyers on bird flu. The Ashanti Regional Director of the Veterinary Services Department, Dr. Kofi Kwansa Filson, said a strong coordinated team involving specialists and professionals is in place to educate and also contain the disease in the event of any further outbreak. He said the decision to temporarily ban the import and export of poultry and poultry products conforms with international conventions. The president of the National Poultry Farmers Association, Mr. Victor Opoenji, was concerned about the inability of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture to involve farmers, especially the association, in paying compensation to those whose farms were directly affected by the disease. A jury has been diagnosed with a cancer of the eye. In October this year, her right eye was removed on account of the advanced nature of the cancer. Benedicta's left eye, which is her only source of vision, and now is gradually becoming affected, and doctors have recommended a focal treatment, which costs 10,000 CDs. She's therefore appealing to the public for financial support. According to Benedicta's mother, the cancer started as a whitish spot in her right eye and later worsened, resulting in the removal of that eye. The mother is unemployed due to her daughter's condition and all efforts to raise the money for the focal treatment have proved futile. Doctors have advised that Benedicta must undergo this treatment in less than a month in order to preserve her life and vision. <laughs> A total of 10,000 Ghana CDs is required for the surgery. Donations should be sent to the following account details. Unibank, Branch, Makola, account number 0700 Alternatively, donors can call 57 35 Nine nine six one five. And that's it for health. We'll be back with some international stories shortly. Thanks for staying with us on the news hour and what's happening in the foreign front. The Rwandan government has announced that the country will vote in a referendum next week 
on a constitutional amendment to allow President Paul Kagame to seek a third term in office. The change will allow Mr. Kagame to potentially remain in power until 2034. The government says Rwandans overseas will vote on the 17th of December, followed by those in the country on the 18th of December. The U.S. has called for Mr. Kagame to set an example for the region by stepping down at the end of his term in 2017. He has hit back at other nations for interfering in the East African nation's internal affairs. Rwanda's Senate approved draft constitutional amendments last month, allowing Mr. Kagame to run in 2017 for another seven-year term. While the amendments shorten the length of a term from seven to five years and maintain a two-term limit, the rules will not take effect until 2024. Mr. Kagame could then potentially run for another two five-year terms. Tanzania's new president, John Magufuli, has joined hundreds of residents in the main city, Dar es Salaam, to take part in a public cleanup operation. Mr. Magufuli picked up rubbish from the street outside State House as part of the scheme which he had ordered to replace Independence Day celebrations. The move is being seen as symbolic of the president's promise to tackle corruption. Thousands of people across Tanzania are reported to have joined the cleanup. Last month, Mr. Magufuli cancelled traditional Independence Day celebrations, which usually include a military parade and concert, saying it will be shameful to spend huge sums of money while the country was facing a serious cholera outbreak. We'll be back with sports. Don't go away. Let's talk sports now. I'm Theophilus Sampa. This is in partnership with Tobinko Pharmaceuticals Limited, producers of Lunat. Now, let's start off from Maka, where the National Paralympic Committee has commenced the fourth Agitos Foundation workshop for stakeholders in the Paralympic movement. The workshop is aimed at providing the participants with the requisite information and knowledge to enhance the organizational capacity of their respective outfits. A workshop aimed at developing Paralympic sports across the globe, especially developing countries, is underway in Accra. Participants have been drawn from the national sports federations and associations, organizations of people with disability and other strategic stakeholders. The educational and technical wing of the International Paralympic Committee, IPC, is funding the two-day workshop which is focused on areas such as the Paralympic Games, strategic partnerships with stakeholders, funding and organizational capacity, among others. The Deputy Director General in charge of Technical at the National Sports Authority, Mr. Sakakwe, urged participants to bring out their best. Other officials charged them to be agents of change. The General Secretary of NPC, Ignatius Elete, said they are poised to excel. Uh, Paralympic sports is one of the sports that has been given medals to the nation. And therefore, there is the need for us to bring all stakeholders together, give them the necessary information for them to also go out there and then see to the development and promotion of para sports. This is the fourth time the NPC is accessing funds from Agitus Foundation to organize a capacity building program. Former President John Ajikum Kufio and Vice President Kwisi Emisatha among the Ghanaian gold sporting giants nominated for the prestigious second Ghana Annual Sports Excellence Awards 2015. The staging of the ceremony will take place in Accra on December 26th. The Ghana Sports Excellence Awards Festival was established in 2014 by Hallmark Plus Multimedia. It is aimed at awarding sports people who have been outstanding during the year under review. Ex-President Kufo has been penciled for the Lifetime Achievement Award with Vice President Emisa Arthur up for the best contributor to disability sports. The Youth and Sports Minister, Dr. Mustafa Ahmed, is in contention with the likes of the President of the Ghana Football Association, Kosinyan Techi, and the President of the Ghana Tennis Federation, Justice Yao Obimpe, for the Best Sports Administrator Award. Here are the remaining nominees. Best Male Athlete. 
Patrick Obin, Disability Sports, Andre Ayu, Soccer, George Darko, Tennis, Richard Sekleu, Athletics, Best Female Athlete, Nadia Eke, Athletics, Mary Zuta, Athletics, Messi Miles, Soccer, Nafisa Tu Umaru, Hockey, Best Sports Personality, Nafisa Tu Umaru, Hockey Player, Richard Sekleu, Athletics, Andre Ayu, Footballer, George Darko, Tennis Player, Best Media House, TV, Metro TV, Multi TV, UTV, GTV, Best Media House, Print, Graphic Sports, Daily Guide Sports, Ghanaian Time Sports, 90 Minutes, Best Reporter, TV, Fierinyan, Vice At One, Romeo Odro, UTV, Theoflos Sampa, GTV, Michael OTJ, TV3, Best Reporter, Radio, Bright Kankambuedu, Love FM Kumasi, Nathan Kwao, City FM Accra, Benedict Ousu Dankwa, Joy FM Accra, Christian Chibweze, Kekeli FM Ho, Best Reporter Print, Kweku Zurek, Daily Graphic, Rosaline Amo, Daily Graphic, Andrew Norte, Ghanaian Time Sports, Kofi Edrienum, Daily Guide Sports. For wrap-up, let's check the scoreboard on what's going on in the ongoing Champions League. And first, we'll take a look at results from last night's games. And in France, Paris Saint-Germain 2, Shakhtar Donetsk 0, Spain, Real Madrid 8, Malmo FF, Germany, Wolfsburg 3, Manchester United 2, England, Man City 4, Bayern München, Gladbach 2, France, PSG 2, CSKA 1, and Portugal, Benfica 1, Atletico Madrid 2, Turkey, Galatasaray 1, FC Asanta 1 and Spain Sevilla 1 Juventus 0. That's all for sports. Entertainment in our segment of the news. My name is Micheline Taka. He is best known for releasing songs before and after elections to point out some of the issues that arise and also sensitize Ghanaians to be vigilant. With the 2016 elections in mind, Kwame Asari Obey, popularly known as A, -plus, was on showbiz earlier to talk about his plans for the next year's e elections. Say, if you are Kuma Chiren, to several of your uncle, may you have money, sir, won't share. Say, my Kuma Fita, Minio Bia, or no one, I may do better. Hey, or you may. Why A, -plus? In everything that I, I hope to do, I hope to achieve, I want it to be on a certain level. Right. Yeah, so A plus is not a name that I chose for myself because I decided to make music. It is a name that I have been called by from secondary school. Mirror, 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 mirror on the wall. That is a nice song. Everybody says, uh, oh, I like that your song. But I like it when I'm able to use music in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm somebody who, want, who, who have always tried to put politicians on their, on their tour. At least I want, I want them to understand that there is a certain eye there or there are some mm -hmm. people out there who are watching what they're doing. And uh, What is it really, the quietness? What is it all about? I do music because I want it to... I want to touch on something, and the timing is very important to me. I just don't want to just release songs every day just to keep myself uh, current or to in the limelight or to, no. I do music because I think that that's the right time, and I want to hit on something, and my timing must always be right. I got to a point where I made everybody understand that, listen, we are now enjoying a democracy. You have the right to write yours in the newspaper. You have the right to say yours on radio. I have the right to put mine on a beat and let everybody listen. Africa is where I want to be. Life will be easy as A, B, C, D. But the leaders, them are greediness, plenty, plenty. Make the whole thing they look like horror movie. Moving on, the Ebenezer Singing Band of the Ebenezer Congregation at Somania in the Eastern Region has climaxed their 40th anniversary celebration with a choral festival. <laughs> The Ebenezer Singing Band was formed 40 years ago through efforts of some founding members of the church. A choral festival to climax the 40th anniversary of the band featured the various singing groups in the church. The main church choir, women's fellowship choir, the praise and worship team, and the church band itself entertained the congregation. <laughs> 
The secretary of the Beneza Singing Band, Mr. William Amano, spoke to GBC24 about the group and said it has come a long way and they are grateful to God. As part of the anniversary activities, members visited the prisons and orphanages to support them. As they gave thanks to God, the Agomeda District Minister and Director of Church Life and Nature of the Dangme Tongu Presbytery, Reverend Nakote, gave a message on the theme, Look, Your Salvation Comes, while asking Christians to rejoice in the face of the challenges. As they gave thanks to God, the Agomeda District Minister and Director of Church Life and Nature of the Dangme Tongu Presbytery, Reverend Nakote, gave a message on the theme, Look, Your Savior Comes, while asking Christians to rejoice in the face of challenges. He said, though it is a few days to end the year, there is still hope. There were presentations in the form of citations to founding members who have helped in the group on its 40-year journey. The Canadian High Commission in Ghana is using an unusual medium to confront some societal ills in the country through mural painting and other activities. They are, it is their hope that by 2020, early and forced marriages would have been kept in the country. This graffiti and mural painting, which started some two weeks ago, is not just for amusement. The meaning it carries is a way to which burdens the nation, especially the most vulnerable women and children. Together with the Ministry of Women, Gender and Social Protection and UNICEF, the Canadian High Commission is using this and other channels to confront the problem of early and forced marriages and child labor in the country. The Minister for Women, Gender and Social Protection Madame Nana Oyelitha, at a ceremony to unveil this piece of art, cautioned Ghanaians, especially parents who marry their children off, to desist from all acts which endanger their children. We have young girls who are married off, who shuttle between school and their marital homes. And when they fall pregnant, they are not able to continue with their education. What we want is for our young girls and boys to stay in school and complete the educational cycle. With the heavy traffic that mounts on the Independence Avenue Street in Accra almost every day, it is the hope of the Commission that whilst this mural catches the attention of all who pass by, its message would be carried along. The High Commissioner of Canada to Ghana, Christopher Tonley, noted that everyone has a responsibility to protect society's most vulnerable. It's a great piece of art. It highlights a very important issue. As you can see, Accra traffic actually helps us. Everybody stopped at looking at it. Uh, they're thinking about it. And they can go to social media, go to Twitter, go to Facebook, and have a better understanding of the challenges that are faced here in Ghana. This painting is the work of a team of young Ghanaian artists from Nima, led by Rufai Zakari. This address child labor. This background that you see here with these buildings was a community that I came from, Nima. And here I also felt like uh, women need to be given their rights. They have to speak for themselves. The handprints here are actual prints from Madame Nana Oyelitha, the Canadian High Commissioner, some school children and some entertainment celebrities in Ghana. That's all entertainment today.